Welcome to the Podcast Digest, the podcast dedicated to helping you find the best shows worthy of your subscription, as well as conversations with their creators. And now, your host, Dan Lazette. All right, folks, welcome back to the Podcast Digest, and I want to thank you again for taking the time to listen and for sharing this show with your friends and family. The last few weeks really have been a blast for me in this show, and if you want to know more, head on over to the thepodcastdigest.info. Several blog entries there sort of telling the story of recent weeks. But let's talk about today. Through the magic of Radiotopia, a podcast collective I've spoken about several times, I discovered an awesome show called The Illusionist. After learning more about that show and its host, I found another new entry on my subscription list called Answer Me This. The common thread here is Helen Zaltzman, a multiple award-winning English podcaster and quite possibly the most talented person I've ever had the privilege to speak to. Her credits extend way beyond the podcasting world into radio and television, writing and theater, and so much more. It's a great honor to welcome Helen Zaltzman to the podcast Digest. Helen, thank you for joining me. Oh, Dan, you're so incredibly charming. How could I resist? <laughs> well, we'll see if that lasts. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> it. I can't thank you enough for really joining me on this show. Uh, I've become a huge fan in a very short amount of time, and uh, the oh, work that I think you. you're doing is uh, absolutely unbelievable. There's so much to talk about. Uh, I mentioned that I came across Answer Me This after finding out about The Illusionist, and I sort of think that maybe the best place to start is way back in 2007. Uh, Tell us a little bit about uh, Answer Me This and and how the idea for this show began. Well, um, bear in mind, when I started podcasting, our first episode came out in January 2007. Um, There weren't iPhones. We weren't on Facebook or Twitter. Those were very much in their infancy. So the landscape of the internet was quite different. I had not listened to a podcast at that point. I knew nothing about them. Uh, But my friend Ollie came up to me at a party and he said, I need to talk to you alone. And I thought, oh, no, is he dying? Um, But he just said, do you want to do a podcast? And not really knowing a reason to say no, I said yes. And um, am I allowed to swear on your show, Dan? Sure, go for it. Okay, Uh, uh, we were were wondering what kind of show to do and and we didn't really know. And uh, a friend of Ollie's just said, make sure it's not two people just chatting shit. So we thought, okay, we'll get a format in. We've always fancied being agony aunts, but we don't want it just to be people's personal problems that might be depressing. So let's open it out to questions of all kinds. So that's still what we do on the show over eight years later. We we try and have questions in each episode from the listeners that are on as many different topics as possible. So there might be a personal problem and something about history or pop culture or food, a nice uh, mixture in there. So if you're not interested in one thing, hopefully you'll be interested in another thing. You mentioned Ollie Mann, one of the co-hosts of the show, and he was one of the original, I guess, uh, members of Answer Me This. Uh, it, you still said there. You, still yep. there. The original said, lineup still intact. You said you guys were friends. I was kind of curious how you two came together. Being together so long on a show like yeah. this, I imagine that uh, you guys have had a, a long relationship. Yeah, we met at university. Uh, so we've been friends when we started the show for six, seven years already. And um, my husband, Martin, is our sound guy. And uh, at the time, Ollie and I thought we don't know how to work mics. But Martin has a bunch of mics because he records music in our living room, which is convenient. So we just thought, well, (laughs) if Martin's going to be there operating the mics, we'd better put him on the show because otherwise he'll be talking in the background anyway. So he's like this little cult figure that pops up uh, with uh, little words of wisdom um, every so often. Um, and Ollie and I had done radio together when we were students and we'd always fancied doing more radio work, um, but it hadn't transpired. So I think that was one of the objectives uh, with Answer Me This. And um, because we spent so much time together in the last eight years, we have a, a slightly cantankerous sibling relationship whereby I don't feel like I have to be polite to him at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you know someone that well, you, you, you can just really cut all of the uh, kindness and formalities and just be really grumpy with each other. So that's how things stand at the moment. You mentioned Martin. He's your husband. He is the third voice on the show. And I originally yeah. wanted to ask you this question, and then I did some more digging in preparation, and I don't know if I'm going to get an answer here, and that's okay. <laughs> Anyone new to this show is going to immediately recognize that Martin sounds very different. He's very deformed. What is the story there, or are, is there one to divulge well no it's really boring actually and and we don't really talk about it lots of people ask um but we want to maintain that mystery 
um, because the answer really is very boring. <laughs> that, <laughs> I can I'm tell gonna, you off the air. Oh, that'll be fine. We can keep the mystery going. And that was my yeah. thought as I d- d- dug a little bit. I found that, that that was kind of a leave it to the listener's imagination to kind yeah, of put in their own exactly. reason. But uh, Your it was one. So much I started wondering truth. pretty much immediately. I was like, wow. A lot of people think it's a mistake, but we've done over 300 episodes. So if we're still making that mistake, that would be incredibly careless. My first thought was a mistake. The second thought and that quickly went away was, this is like the voice of God. <laughs> uh, the third thought was, is this someone's inner thoughts? All of <laughs> those of, things. <laughs> I kind of went through all of that and uh, figured uh, yeah, it, it's a neat effect either way. I think it uh, adds to the, to the presentation. He's a very mysterious man. You talked about, um, what we talked about just before we came on, we made a reference to editing. And famously, uh, your editing prowess is, is well-renowned. In fact, did, you know, your, did you know your Wikipedia page, Helen, mentions uh, how much editing effort you put into each episode? No, well, I wonder why someone would think to put that in, as if that is an encyclopedia-worthy fact. I don't know why I'm on there anyway. I think yeah. it was probably a podcast listener who was bored that put us up there. I'm, I'm also on the list of... Uh, people who come from my hometown um, i think it's me and sid vicious and then a bunch of people i've never heard of oh wow wow yeah <laughs> the uh the it, it makes a reference to like 10 hours per episode in editing is that somewhat still the case or yeah what, is a, what does an assembly look like for uh, each new episode answer me this yeah well we record for about 90 minutes or so and then i'll do a rough edit which takes takes four to six hours and then I'll send that to Ollie he'll listen several times and then send me back uh, his edit notes and then I'll make another edit um and um so then it's down to about 40 minutes so we we thought at the beginning and I'd never edited audio before we started doing the podcast um we thought no one knows who we are and there are a lot of well-known people on the internet already doing podcasts even though at the time that was a fraction of what there are now um, but we realised we were competing with all of the internet and we thought we can't afford just to put our unedited talking out because no one needs to hear that. We thought we have to give people something that's quite punchy and and is rewarding their time by cutting out the bits that are boring. Um, hopefully, obviously there are some bits that some people will find boring, but we had to do the best we could to make it non-boring. Um, because, and, and I still believe that, I think um, unedited podcasts are really making a big presumption that a listener does, is obliged to listen to everything that comes out of your mouth. It, it feels like your time is more important than theirs, and I just don't think that's the case, really. The listener could be off doing so many other things, so if they've chosen you, just repay that decision with a lot of gratitude. A lot of my listening audience, Helen, especially when I first started in, and even now I think it still sits at the core, are fellow podcasters. And there is obviously an ongoing conversation about the need for editing, how much editing is too much, how much is too little, what do you leave in, what do you not. Obviously, you see a big value in the editing process, and, and I've seen you make reference before in terms of you know valuing the listener's time. Uh, have you found that over these years that that effort has been less have you guys kind of become more of a, a one take type thing or is it kind of throw it all against the wall and keep the best stuff is, is how does that work it is very liberating to know that you've got editing there because it means that we can try things that might not work and it really doesn't matter um when we do live radio we can we can just do it and it is fine but i think with podcasting given that you can change things why not and then um with the illusionist my new show It feels like the edit there is quite different because I'm trying to construct a narrative out of an interview. I start with an interview that I've done and from there a story or almost like an essay starts to emerge with different paragraphs and stuff. So that's very much editing led and then I fill it in with my own links and extra bits of information that I found out since I interviewed the person and other bits and bobs. Um, so I find the editing process very, very creative. Not everybody has to edit as much as I do, um, but I just think it's good to start at the beginning of something rather than 10 minutes before the beginning. Or was, a lot of people want to start in the middle, in fact, of a, a story, you know, plunge people right in there. And I think that's quite an interesting approach that uh, maybe one day I'll explore. Maybe one day I'll get it down to just a single sentence per podcast. <laughs> might that's be a dream. little too concise. Maybe. <laughs> might be a little too concise. <laughs> Uh, uh, you, we talked about how when Answer Me This started, 
one of the genesis of the ideas was to have the listeners bring in questions. And mm. you guys pretty much open it up to any kind of question. Now, something I talk about a lot is listener engagement and feedback and things like that. Uh, obviously, you guys are really strong in that territory. I came across the uh, FAQ page for Answer Me This, it, oh, which no. is phenomenally written, by the it's way. It's a bit <laughs> neglected. There's so it's, many more cues that uh, we could FA. It, it holds up really well in oh, terms good. of, you know, if you've sent a question and it hasn't been read, here are like the eight different reasons why it yeah. could be, which oh. I thought was excellent. I feel but, so bad because you've only got, well, I don't know, a tiny percentage chance of getting your question on Answer Me This. But people don't know. They send us in these incredibly written things that are very heartfelt and they don't know that we're just sick of talking about that topic or we have absolutely nothing interesting to say or we tried it and it didn't work and that's not their fault. What subject do you think, Helen, that you guys get the most questions? You know, health, relationships, kind of what, what are some of the most asked topics? Oh, well, people are very interested in their own bowels, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, whenever I see uh, an email which has something um, human excretion related in the title, my heart sinks. <laughs> so there are a lot <laughs> of those. No, there's, uh, there's not that much I have to say about it. Um, we get a lot from teenagers, young teens who, who are like, uh, I like a girl. Does she like me? What do I do? Am I being friend zoned? And uh, because we're, we're quite old now and patronising, we're just like, ah, oh, you're not special. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> felt that. <laughs> uh, but of course, on the other hand, I remember being a teenager and I remember how intense and important those feelings are. So I don't want to uh, patronise teenagers because I think it's really great, the kind of discourse we have with them. It really makes you think, don't underestimate young people at all. We get people really young, actually. We get eight or ten-year-olds writing wow. in who are, I don't think they should be listening to the show. But um, <laughs> that's uh, sometimes their parents have listened it to, have played it to them, which uh, I think is remarkable. Um, but I really I really love the insight we get into listeners' lives. They, they divulge so much and so trusting. Sometimes you think they are not getting the support they need for some very real problems or for a family situation but on the whole it's just it's just this huge cloud of curiosity that we get to stick our fingers into that's a very messy uh, analogy um and um we thought by now we would have run out of questions and yet new listeners find the show all the time and they have all these questions backed up that we get the benefit of so that it's still going must have answered thousands by now i lost count have you ever gotten a question that's really worried you or concerned you or you want to reach out to them almost personally like off the recording and just say you know here's a you know a help number yeah. or something yeah every every week there's really? someone like and i i try to email people personally we get them um, say teenagers self-harming um occasionally things about sexual assault and it's a comedy podcast oh, we make and we're really uh ripping apart people's questions and obviously we're not going to touch those subjects are really right. serious um but it's so odd to me that they send them to us as if that would be an okay thing to do and and so we had uh, someone writing in just before christmas who'd uh, recently uh, lost their spouse in a really tragic way and um and so I referred them to some bereavement organizations but I thought I'm, I'm so out of my depth with this I'm not right. qualified at all um, so yeah, it does scare me quite a lot. Do you do you think that folks have assigned uh, the three of you sort of a level of expertise that maybe you don't actually have? And <laughs> yes, yeah. I absolutely think that we have no expertise. Just got uh, quite good googling skills. <laughs> it's all about the googling, that's for absolutely. sure. Absolutely. And on the whole, answer me this: it has you guys are north of three hundred episodes. You guys are biweekly right now. Is that right? Uh, yes, we used to be weekly, and then Ollie got a radio job that was one till three in the no one till four in the morning, uh, five nights a week, which just meant he was permanently jet lagged, and it really ruins your life doing those hours. So there's uh, no good reason to be up uh, working at four in the morning. Uh, so we went down to every other week, but actually it was really nice because um, it, I, I felt like I was really revitalised to do the show and it left me um, enough time to start doing other projects. Whereas when I was spending three days a week doing Answer Me This every week, it was uh, it, it meant that I was my time was so limited to, to try doing new things. 
And this may seem like a little obvious, but this has been a success, correct? I know that you have been recognized with several different awards. The show is long running. Obviously, you guys have gotten a lot of positive feedback. Uh, sort of for answer me this, we're going to get to the, your other efforts in just a moment, but sort of <laughs> what's the future? You, you, you mentioned you're at a biweekly at this point. Is it kind of more of the same or that you have ideas for the future or? Quite a lot happened um, in the first few years of the show. Uh, we wrote a book adaptation of the podcast. That was really exciting because um, we did that with the publishing company that T.S. Eliot co-founded. And they were saying, oh, wow. if you sign to us, you can see T.S. Eliot's table. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, I've seen it. I haven't touched so it. So you signed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that was incredible because we thought, right, they've got all this poetry. They published Sylvia Plath and stuff. And now us, this really, really silly book, the kind of book you keep in your toilet and you give to you're, people for Christmas. But you're on the list, gift. Helen. You're on the yeah, list. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think now we're in uh, remainder shops. So, <laughs> but it was really fun to, to do that project. But um, it felt for all, the first few years of doing the podcast that it was a means to getting other work. And now it very much feels like the podcast is, um, it's, it's his own end. It's such, it's such a joy to do that show and reach so many people around the world who, and I, I, because it's such an interactive format, um, it's lovely to hear people's responses and often they'll correct us or they'll supply a personal anecdote. What's really weird is we'll talk about something and, in the back of our minds, we'll know that no matter how obscure, there is probably somebody who has that job. So a couple of years ago, we were talking about um, the Winter Olympics event, the skeleton, which is that really frightening one where you essentially slide down an ice chute on a tea tray. <laughs> and um, the, we, the next week, we got this email from the woman who just won the gold medal for Great Britain in the skeleton event because wow. she listened to us when she was doing her training. And we thought that is <laughs> absolutely blew my mind. <laughs> but initially, when we put in the interactive uh, format, um, like I said, Twitter and Facebook didn't exist. And so the interactivity wasn't uh, the thought that we have to include interactivity because that's what you do with entertainment. Uh, it was just we thought, well, we don't want to have to think up all of our material ourselves. It was quite a pragmatic decision, but one that has worked out very well. As a sidestep, you brought up social media and you are uh, wonderfully engaging. Uh, <laughs> unlike, unlike many other hosts uh, tend not to be, so don't to speak. Is, is, that a, is that something that, that you enjoy? Obviously, speaking with listeners and, and, and people who uh, you know have uh, listened to you uh, on BBC, BBC or, or bought the book, uh, what have you. It's a big deal to you. Is, is, are you comfortable in that social media space? No real issues there? Or? I, I think I'm incredibly lucky. I don't want to tempt fate, but I, I don't have a bad experience on Twitter. Hardly ever does anyone say anything rude or mean. People say really interesting stuff. And, um, and so it feels like a real treat. Also, I work on my own in my own flat. So I'm quite uh, I'm quite lacking in office space uh, interactions, for instance, you know, just general chit chat and conversations because I'm by myself all the time. So Twitter and Facebook feel like a real lifeline. Um, and sometimes if I'm tweeting a lot, you can probably infer that I'm really bored that day. <laughs> um, but yeah, send her some yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just uh, just anything. Send me send me a picture or a link to an article or something that will uh, waste another few minutes of my time. Um, but uh, sorry, my thought has just fallen out of my brain uh, but yeah I think uh, also podcast listeners until now um, I think maybe as podcasting gets bigger this might change but until now I think they've been some of the nicest people on the internet and I don't know whether that's because it's so much more difficult to comment on a podcast the way that you would with a YouTube video where you can just vent all of the hate in your heart mm -hmm. at someone like Rebecca Black where the podcast listeners they, it, it's such a hassle for them to find your show even now that it's easier they, if they find it and they stick with it, then um, they're probably quite into you and uh, quite positive. I think that's exactly right. And I've heard that from other hosts as well, that their podcast audience, especially those that, you know, may do writing or may do YouTube videos. A few weeks ago, I spoke to a gentleman by the name of Michael Fisher with Pocket Now, and that's a mobile tech site. He will do product reviews, new cell phones, things of that nature. And he'll do a YouTube video and have just hundreds of hateful oh, comments. Why? But then What's wrong he, with people? I, I, I wish I knew the answer to that. But then he'll do his weekly podcast, and it's nothing but love, you know, nothing but Aww. great questions and interaction and and, and I think you're right. A podcast listener, it takes so much more, quote, work to find, yes. to, to download, to listen. And 
you know, if if you've got an issue with a, a personality, you're probably bailing much earlier on in the process yeah. than being 300 episodes in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If if I'm listening to a podcast and I'm not enjoying it, the first four minutes feels like an hour. And I've, well, I've never left a review for a podcast I love. I, I will tweet episodes of things that I really like to... Uh, to spread them around but I've never actually reviewed them but I've never reviewed something I hate all I do is switch it off and I never listen to it again exactly I I we are kindred spirits Helen I've actually said the same thing on this show in previous episodes that if we've you got don't manners like it, Dan yes yes <laughs> if you don't like it just go somewhere else there's no yes. reason to to trash other people's work and, and on my show and I, I'm still a new show but on mine I've I've never been negative about any other show my position is we're all in this doing the same type of thing and putting out our you know our best effort well, who am I to trash what you're doing you know and and that's the, if, if more people on the internet especially on YouTube had that perspective I think it might be a lot better place that's for sure yeah I think doing podcasting has made me uh, better in that way because now I just think for people to do anything even something quite crummy it's effort and it's it's something that they've they've really had to motivate themselves to do so uh, i should cut them some slack even if it's not very good <laughs> it happens that's for sure i'm so I, incredibly I, judgmental i am misrepresenting myself <laughs> <laughs> that's okay it's you can be judgmental you just don't have to leave it in a comment quite exactly, exactly. <laughs> Let's go and talk about The Illusionist, because that yeah. is how I came across you, and that is uh, one of your current efforts. I mean, I guess you have several current efforts, but that is, through Radiotopia, one of my favorite homes. I call it a podcast collective. I don't know if that's the right term or no, not. I think, but I think that's good, yeah. Yeah, and uh, all the work over there uh, is, I've recommended Strangers. I've had Phoebe Judge from Criminal on Aww. about 10 episodes. She was awesome to talk to. I've wanted to meet her so much. Oh, she was great. She was so wonderful, and... Um, Everything over at Radiotopia is great, but for, before we get into some details, before uh, anyone who hasn't heard about this show, tell them a little about, uh, a bit about what you're doing there. Uh, I've always been very interested in um, the evolution of language and the history of words and um, so forth, and um, this show is an opportunity for me just to really get my teeth into that. On Answer Me This over the years, we have a lot of questions as to why are certain phrases this way, or where did a particular word come from, and this show is is just that it's like little documentaries about um words and phrases i guess so i've i've done episodes i've not done that many episodes yet at the moment i feel like i've been doing the show for ages but there are hardly any <laughs> episodes of it um so there's one coming out um very soon that's about uh, cryptic crosswords and how they how they make clues for those and and how you go about constructing a cryptic crossword but there are other episodes that are about specific words and um, I guess it's just finding something I'm interested in that is language related and just trying to find someone to talk to that I think will be interesting on that subject. And then often I discover a story that I wasn't even expecting from this discussion with them and then an episode will arise. So it's very exciting. It's kind of led by curiosity. How, uh, lucky me. It's lovely. Lovely to be able to do that. And I have read this before, but I'd like my listeners to know kind of how this show came to be uh, <laughs> it, it it was a really interesting story i know roman mars was involved in a lot of his travel but retell the tale if you don't mind uh, it's so bonkers to me roman mars is a big fan of answer me this and you wouldn't think it because he's he's everyone thinks he's uh, the messiah and um he, he he's done nothing to disprove this fact as well <laughs> um and um yet yeah, he's been listening to our really silly comedy show for years and he's been incredibly supportive of it and um uh about 18 months ago, he called me up and he was saying, I've had this idea for this thing. I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. Would answer me this, be interested. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. And um, and eventually they went with a collective of story-driven shows and um, and answer me this is not like that at all. So I understood. And um, then he uh, came over to stay with us for a week last summer. He had some stuff to do in London. And um, so I thought, well, let's get him while he's jet lagged and vulnerable. So I was taking him for a walk <laughs> around our local park and I said, I've got this idea for this show. Because I knew he was still interested in uh, getting me uh, into Radiotopia somehow. And um, I, I, so I described the show and um, he said, OK, leave it with me. And then a few weeks later, I got an email from him saying, yeah, I think it might happen. And then I started having discussions with PRX and I was just trying to impress upon them that I could make a show that uh, could be commercially viable and that I'd bring out regularly because a lot of the people making the very artistic shows in the network, they, they want to do them when they want to do them because it, it requires a lot more inspiration. And I think me making my show just requires me to, uh, to actually 
uh, stop lying around and watching Netflix and, and just do some work and I have to give myself deadlines, otherwise nothing happens. And, um, and so to my surprise, it, it actually got incorporated in the Kickstarter campaign and I didn't really think it was real until I went over while they were having the Kickstarter campaign. They had an event in New York and they announced it. And I was like, oh, wow, this is actually going to happen. This will become my job. That was a really incredible <laughs> feeling. And what's the listener response been like? Obviously, they're not sending in questions per se, but uh, what have you heard uh, in terms of uh, listener response? Um, it's been it's been really delightful. Uh, they'll they sometimes send in questions where they're curious about a word. Um, one one listener she wrote in saying, um, "I don't know if you know about this. My PhD is about made up words and dictionaries that lexicographers put in there as copyright traps. I'd never heard of this before." Uh, so I got her on the show. So that was just a, um, a listener. I think she listens to Answer Me This as well. And I got a whole show out of it. But people have been really great. And um, every every episode, I think, oh, they like the last one. This one's different. They might not like it. Um, but I think they're just, they're okay with going with it. And hopefully each show will give them a little nugget of knowledge or a fact that they can use as small talk at a party or something. I feel if I give them that, then uh, my job is largely done. It's not a very lofty ambition. Well, I think the subject matter is definitely interesting in, in that you know nugget of information to share at a party. But I will argue, Helen, that people are coming to it and sticking around because of you. That's oh, what thanks. I think is actually happening there. And uh, Well, they don't I, have to stick for too long as well. It's 15 <laughs> minutes every couple of weeks. So that's nice as well, not demanding too much of their time. <laughs> And I'm not sure who's responsible, if you have a hand or not, or if it's the, the folks uh, over at Radiotopia. But, uh, folks, if you're just now finding this show, make sure to check out the website. Uh, oh, thank you. The, 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 the website is really cool. First of all, you've got the, the individual episode art with the, uh, <laughs> with the dice, with the letters, which yeah, the is boggle excellent. Set. Yes. I, lo- I love Boggle so much. I hope Boggle don't take exception to me using the Boggle set. It's- I think it's excellent. So yeah. this, th- that was your idea. Yeah, they've uh, Radiotopia. They're they're a great guiding hand. If if you need them to say yes or no to something, then they will. But generally, they just leave me alone to get on with it. Uh, so it's in, I have complete creative freedom. Sometimes that's terrifying because I've been working so far on this show completely by myself, and I thought I don't know whether my decisions are right or not. Um, and uh, sometimes I feel like I'm going a bit deranged, just second guessing myself. But on the other hand, it's such an incredible privilege to get paid to do exactly what you want, that I'm not complaining at all. So it feels like I'm very much learning whilst making the show how to make the show. But that's been a very exciting experience. And I think that I bring up the website because it's got so many neat things. You've got your MailChimp word of the day with a screenshot from a dictionary. Yes, which so I that think... <laughs> if people want to learn it properly and uh, know how to spell it, they've, they've got the wherewithal to do that for their spelling bees. I think that is excellent. And, and not to mention, you know, the, the, the supplementary links and, and the credits and music and so on and so forth. It's, it's just a really neat read, a nice little companion piece to the show itself. So, folks, if you are subscribing to The Illusionist, as I know you're doing right now. Yes, do as uh, the man says. Yes, check out the website as well. It's, it's really interesting stuff. I think uh, it's neat. Thank you. Because often when I'm, I'm researching a show, I find out lots of interesting things that I can't fit into the show. But I think people would enjoy. But also it's a bit sad because with Answer Me This as well, I know that it's a tiny fraction of listeners that actually visit the website. Right. Oh. Yeah, you wish, right? I wish you <laughs> yeah. could get them all over there. Yeah, I, I, just come and I, hang out, guys. I know that experience, that's mm. for sure. The topic selection for this show, uh, yes. it's, it's an interesting genre, I guess you could say. How do you go about deciding what uh, each episode will be about? Well, before... Before I began, when I was pitching to Roman, I'd been jotting down ideas for quite a while for this show on the off chance I ever got to make it. At the time when I was pitching it to him, I wanted to, but I just couldn't afford to do another podcast because uh, I was doing Answer Me This, which earns some money, but not enough to live on. And I thought I need to use my extra time to earn enough money to live on because otherwise I'll get evicted. And um, so I had a lot of ideas before I started. Um, I had, uh, I thought there are at least a year, two years show ideas here, but I've, uh, I've had, um, I've used maybe three or four of them. Uh, at the moment most of the ideas have happened after the show began so as soon as I think oh this could be interesting and I find out that yes it could be interesting 
um, because sometimes etymology is disappointing and you can look up the word origin and it's just obscure. You think, OK, well, that's a dead end. But if I find it is interesting, I take a note of it. And then sometimes I feel like that idea is sticking with me right now and that is the one to pursue. But also at the moment, because the show is um, is so new, it feels like I should be doing things each time that are a bit different to the last time so that after a while it will feel like this uh, quite disparate uh, collection of shows is unified by its by their differences between each other. I'm explaining that badly, even though I'm supposed to be somebody who's good at uh, using words. <laughs> Makes sense to me. <laughs> good. Well, you're very generous. <laughs> its consistency is its variety. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I guess it's just led by what I'm interested in at the time that I've also managed to find a way to turn into a story. There's um, There's a word at the moment that I think there's going to be a really good episode, but so far everyone I've approached has refused to be on the episode about it. And it's not even a controversial word at all. <laughs> so I'm working on it, but it, m- it might take a year to get that going. It's such a unique idea for a show. I don't know, maybe you know in, in, in research and looking around, I don't know that there are any other podcasts in this lane, so to speak, and, hmm. and about you know words and their history or their misuse or their evolution or whatever you know the, the angle you're going for in each particular episode. I, I don't know that there's anything else like it. Well, I've deliberately avoided listening to other shows that are at all about words. So there are lots of shows about words like uh, Grammar Girl, who's been going for years and years about correct usage, and there's um, Lexicon valley from slate but i didn't want to hear something in someone else's show and digest it and then later accidentally plagiarize it or deliberately plagiarize it (laughs) um and uh, so i thought well at least if i do it out of ignorance then it's an accident um so this may sound really stupid to people like deliberately keeping myself misinformed but um it just feels like at the moment the right thing to do especially as well when i'm trying to develop this show and i didn't know what the show is going to be until i started making it and i didn't know how to make it so i could only do that by making it and now i think i've got an okay idea of what it is but it still feels like in a year the show could be quite different to what it is like now and then in two years i'll think well a year ago i thought i really had this pegged and actually it didn't at all It'll be an interesting evolution to watch, that's for sure. Unless and, it goes uh, worse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I highly doubt it. I think no. your track record in, in, in producing audio entertainment is pretty stellar, and I, oh, I have thanks. no worries about how The Illusionist will go in the future. I'll just that's be anxious comfort. to listen, to be honest. <laughs> uh, Good. You mentioned the uh, Kickstarter was uh, sort of the Radiotopia effort to bring on new shows, and I do know, and please correct me if I'm misquoting this, that one of Roman's intentions uh, in the uh, edition roster spots was to uh, up the representation of women in podcasting, yes. especially on Radiotopia. Yes. That's a great segue to something I found out that you actually have a third podcast as well that you do monthly. Is that uh, correct? Yes. Well, I, I, I recently retired from making ah. the Sound Women podcast because um, I, couldn't, I couldn't commit to it on top of doing The Allusionist as well. Uh, but it, I did it for nearly two years, and it was... Um, Sound Women is a lobby group that uh, started in Britain, uh, I think, three or four years ago, because our radio industry is uh, quite sexist. And um, Sound Women did a study, and they found that one in five voices on air is female, which is pretty terrible. And also, that's not even representing the ones that are actually allowed to say anything rather than just giggle at male co-hosts and then read the weather. So that wasn't very good. And they were also finding out that behind the scenes, it wasn't a whole lot better. And women were really dropping out at, uh, after a few years in the business. They just couldn't really take any more the fact that there were fewer opportunities for them. So they've been trying to change that in a very positive way. And... Um, so they approached me to see if I would get involved and I thought, I don't want a job that involves any admin. So I offered to make a <laughs> podcast for them. And um, so for a couple of years, I just interviewed people that I thought were interesting in the radio industry, some on air and some off air, because people, uh, people are really, have really fascinating to me when they're talking about their jobs and often really unexpectedly. I find a lot of the people who work off air really hate to be interviewed because they're so perfectionist. They're used to being in control of the interview and they think they're terrible and they're really self-critical and they're great and they're really interesting. But that kind of uh, self-flagellation process was uh, curious to watch. I've, I've had a, the good fortune, Helen, in the last uh, couple of months of doing this show to speak to a handful of women podcasters. I've spoke with Sarah Stewart from Getting There on the 5 by 5 Network, Phoebe Judge from Criminal, Home with Radiotopia, and now yourself. Um, any listener to podcasts, though, is well aware that there is, uh, as you mentioned, a, a sorely a, a shortage of women in podcasting. 
what are your theories on why that might be and, and an even a bigger, broader, harder to answer question? How do you think that gets fixed? Yeah, well, I think it is becoming much more fixed. And um, I think people like Roman saying we have to fix this and the way we're going to do that is by positive discrimination. It helps. It's drawing attention to it because it does really make no sense that women are underrepresented in uh, in audio mediums. And um, I think also, with uh, for a long time, just every time you got a list of, say, the best 15 podcasts you have to listen to, there were very few uh, female voices in those lists. And then Serial came along, and so every right. list had Serial in. Yes. And I, w- I wouldn't listen to Serial and think, oh, this is a woman, and it's a show. I'm only thinking about the show when I listen to shows. Uh, no matter what they're about. But I think it did just actually make people a bit more uh, flexible towards um, what they would write about. And and also I think it took quite a lot of people complaining that uh, women were underrepresented and this situation um, is uh, ridiculous, is uh, I think a a polite uh, word to uh, use about it. Um, But I don't know why it resulted, because in radio... There are so many gatekeepers and um, there are fewer opportunities for women. And I've, I've sensed this myself. And even if you're not getting um, directly uh, f- confronted with it, like in the past, um, I think uh, a lot of people I know, they were just told that they were never going to be able to get certain jobs because of the way they looked or things like that, even though it's radio. So it doesn't matter what you look like. And a lot of the male presenters are not very... Uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, if, if <laughs> we're, if we're ju- yeah, if we're judging people that way, uh, then I went there. Aesthetically displeasing. Um, so radio, there are lots of reasons why people couldn't get um, the jobs, even if they wanted to. Whereas podcasting, you can just do it yourself. So I didn't know why women weren't. There was a study a couple of years ago, I think, that suggested that one in ten podcasters was female. I think it was Time Magazine that did it, and then Stitcher did another one, which was not dissimilar a statistic. And I think now there are more female podcasters because more people are aware of the medium. It started off very much in um, technology and so you had to be very tech savvy to listen to a podcast and to make a podcast. And most of the people listening to them knew about tech and um, not the women don't know about those things, but it's not necessarily the most uh, woman inviting environment as a listener or as a, a podcaster. And I think as the medium has broadened that, that means more women will think, okay, my idea could work as a podcast. And I think also the technology has got easier and cheaper, so it's much easier for people to start doing it. It was quite daunting when we began, and we didn't really know how to do it. Um, But now it's it's not much harder than starting a blog, and women have done very well in that space. Right, right. But then you get women getting criticised for their voices, and so that's one reason why they might just think, oh, I can't be bothered with this. It's just not worth me getting uh, lambasted all the time every time I put out an episode. I'd rather do something that doesn't get critiqued like that. You know, I think you just read my mind. I was actually going to bring that up to you. I was going to say, well, there's definitively a shortage of hosts, and and I could be wrong here. It seems like maybe on contributors there might be a little bit more, and I'm thinking about This American Life, and I'm thinking Mm. about, uh, you know, Snap Judgment. There are plenty of women contributors, and often those stories we can wake out are, are some of the best. About two months ago, again, I could be wrong, This American Life had a whole section yeah. uh, where they were talking about vocal fry. That was and a that great they, episode. I, my mind was blown. I never heard anything like that before. Had, no. had, had you heard those type of things in all your years of podcasting? I've never been on the receiving end of that. I think my voice is quite annoying, but that's because I have to listen to it all the time. Everyone thinks their own voice is annoying. Um, But I think this maybe is an American criticism against Americans. I'd only come across the term vocal fry a couple of months before that. Um, I think it was some commenters on a piece I was reading about podcasts. Maybe I think it was about Serial, actually. They were critiquing Sarah Koenig's vocal fry. And I had no idea what that term meant. And therefore, I'd never actually identified vocal fry when I was hearing it so it never bothered me when I didn't know it existed so I feel like it's being somewhat perpetuated by people talking about it and complaining about it and they don't tend to complain about it when men do it but a lot of uh, men do it Roman Mars does it sounds good I really don't mind it um but people just then they really weigh in I think they they get angry that they feel women are infantilizing themselves but I don't think vocal fry is very infantilizing there are other ways to infantilize yourself, but I heard, uh, yeah, I heard that. Noticeable. I heard that segment on This American Life, and they were talking with some of the contributors, reporters that were identified as having this, and they were even attempting to play examples of what 
you know, right, uh, people listening and writing in had said it was, and I still couldn't hear it. I still no. can't to this day. Because <laughs> it's not important. <laughs> you're, you're right. <laughs> you're too highly evolved, Dan. You can't I even hear so. it. I think so. The content in the story is what I'm focusing on. Everybody has a different tone of voice in whatever, you know, it's somebody in person, somebody on TV, somebody on a radio or a podcast. Some you enjoy, some you don't. But yeah. I don't know that that would be reason to not listen to the story. But maybe I'm just crazy. Some people, uh, I think most people have a very visceral reaction to voices and sometimes you just hear one that makes you uncomfortable and you can't necessarily identify why um but you just have to overcome that because hopefully if the content's good then it doesn't really it doesn't really ruin it for me if someone's got a slightly unpleasant voice and and there are many ways in which a voice can be unpleasant that are nothing to do with vocal fry or women having higher voices than men or anything like that just sometimes you don't like something it's that's fine isn't it people have different tastes but yeah just i don't know again it's one of those things where you just think why are you bothering to criticize this in an online place why don't you just think oh, actually i'm not going to finish typing this uh, thing because people generally can't really help their voices it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard, and uh, literally, if they hadn't run that segment, I never, I would have been oblivious the whole time. Yeah, because no, no, exactly. <laughs> no idea. But but I do vocal fry myself. I can't consciously do it. I can't do the impression of it. But it's where uh, your voice goes down into a, a kind of creak. Um, but I think because I have an English accent, people listening don't identify the vocal fry that I do do. So I think I, maybe I get away with things because because people are uh, just uh, distracted by the accent. I think so, and it immediately makes you, you know, uni- unilaterally appealing to all Americans. So. Yeah, I, I, I love it. Whenever I go to America, people are so delightful. As soon as they hear the accent, they go, can you just read the phone book to me? And uh, I think, oh, I wish I had that reaction when I'm at home. No one cares here. <laughs> I saw you mention that in that interview you had a couple months back on the website about podcasting, uh, The Timber. And folks, I'm going to include a link to that interview in the show notes to make sure to go and read that more. Uh, Helen had a great interview uh, with the folks over there at The Timber. and uh, That's a good I, I, website generally. If you're interested in podcasts, they have some fascinating stuff on there. And I, I, I saw you, you talked about how, you know, Americans were so nice. And oh, yeah. What was funny is I, I'm 36 years old when I was 15. I had the wonderful opportunity to do a, a two-week trip through school, and London and England were uh, our first stop for four days. And uh, ever since that experience, uh, it's been my lottery-winning dream to relocate. And one of the main Aww. reasons is everybody was so nice. Everybody were was they? so kind. Yes. That's good to hear, because London has such a bad reputation in that way. And I, I like to think that actually uh, people will pleasantly surprise you more often um, if you're looking out for that, you'll realise that often people are very kind. If you lose your wallet, say, they'll come running after you or th- things like that. Um, but I, I often wonder, because I live in London, whether it's quite a hostile environment to visitors and whether if, you know, if you're coming from America where you've seen, say, uh, it represented on film, you come and think, ah, oh, it's nothing like that. Ah, oh, the Queen's not just walking around, damn it. Because uh, <laughs> when I come to America, I think, God, it is like the films. <laughs> I'm living in a film. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was wonderful. Now, to to, oh, to, to exhibit that I didn't just have, you know, rose-colored glasses on the whole time, Paris, on the other hand, just hated Americans. Oh, <laughs> they that's knew a shame. You, they, were, they knew you were an American from a long ways away, and it, 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 it came through in the interaction without doubt, but never had any of that uh, oh, in good. London. And uh, really enjoyed my experience there. Come back. Uh, Come back. Yes. Oh, someday. If I had, like I said, if I win the lottery. Yeah, keep gambling. <laughs> Yes, going to work on that. <laughs> Before we uh, wrap things up, Helen, I did want to cover one more thing in case this Ooh. is uh, one of these still live and active things on your website. I noticed that you also are a participant in the Podcasters Support Group. Yes, I, I created that support group because um, uh, I that last summer I was getting asked a lot by people, how do you start a podcast? And, um, and I thought, when we started, we didn't know anything. We had a copy of the book Podcasting for Dummies. You have that series in America, right? It's like of wine course. tasting for dummies. and It's a really Everything. terrible book, Podcasting for Dummies. It was so complicated. Uh, we It almost destroyed us before we began. But we muddled through and managed to do it. And um, I just thought there are things that I know through trial and error and just bitter experience. That if I tell someone, maybe that will save them a few weeks or a few months or at least just if they're trying to work out a format, they can come and talk to someone about it. So... I started having these um, meetups about every three months where people could come and um, just ask a lot of questions they couldn't find an answer to elsewhere. And um, 
then when Roman was over, we did one. Obviously, a lot of people turned up because they just wanted to breathe the same air. But <laughs> what was really nice at that one was seeing the attendees just meeting each other and sparking off each other and exchanging ideas and making friends. And I just thought, oh, this is really great uh, because it is such a lonely business podcasting. I don't know whether you found this, but I found for several years just being in a room on my own, listening to my own voice in the edit was uh, <laughs> was quite a lonely and isolated experience. And so now it's it's more steered towards that just people forming these these bonds with each other and trying to create a community Uh, because also I think podcasting is a few years behind in Britain and um, so there isn't much of a community yet and I thought maybe well maybe it would just help some people actually to get it started if if I can do this I'm envisioning a dream scenario that if I could actually ever play a role in something like this. Uh, a couple of weeks back, I had the chance to interview Mike Hurley from Relay FM, and I believe he is also based out of London. And he has a podcast network with eight or nine shows on it, all Ooh. basically technology focused. And he actually did a meetup about three weeks ago because one of his co hosts, very similar to what you just mentioned with Roman Mars coming over, uh, Jason Snell, used to be an editor of Macworld, you know, an Apple centric oh, yeah. Reporter, he came over and they do a show together and they did it in person and then had like a six hour meetup at a six bar in hours. London Good with grief. all with all the listeners, you know, came in and, and talked to them very much what you're referring to as a quarterly thing. They did it, you know, as a one off. Uh, and between your efforts there and, and Mike's efforts, I, I think you guys could uh, basically take over all of print and podcasting. Yeah. I mean, you guys are, are very. Uh, well-renowned in the podcasting community and uh, imagine the insight both of you would have would be amazing. So, Well, if he'll do the admin, then uh, that could work well. Uh, <laughs> no well, admin involved. <laughs> damn, there's a bit of admin because you've, you've got you've to find a place for them to congregate and tell them to turn up. I suppose what he was doing, though, is something to get listeners uh, together, whereas these are for uh, the people that want to make them. I've never really done many of the listener meetups yet. Well, um, oh, Mike sure. recently did a uh, talk at an Apple store on how to be an independent podcaster, and yeah. Apple featured we've, it. And, yeah, we've uh, all been there. Yes. All done those so, talks. Yes, indeed. I wonder whether his was better than mine, though, <laughs> in terms of actually getting something working for yourself. Well, I know Apple made it a podcast, and they published it. So yeah. that was uh, that was a big deal. So, um, yeah, I, I think I'm just uh, immediately drawn to all uh, English-based podcasts at this point. <laughs> oh, well, uh, good luck finding some. <laughs> well, well, I got into No Such Thing as a Fish a few oh, weeks back. That and, was a good show. Uh, that oh, was a yes. fun show. I, I really do enjoy that one as well. So um, before we go, Helen, future plans. Uh, you've got uh, two shows going right now. And um, what do you see the, the future holding? Anything new on the horizon? This is the first point of my career ever that I haven't been thinking, right, I'll probably be doing something different in the future. What I'm doing now, how can I get to that point? I'm just thinking I'm really enjoying what I'm doing now. And I would just like to be able to make the shows for a while because the illusionist I I, when I started I knew that I had the funding to do it for a year I knew that I could be just making my podcast for a year and not have to scrabble to find the other work that I was doing as a freelancer so at the moment I'm just thinking right how can I make this show and how can I make it better so hopefully the challenges will come from the work rather than from having to find the work and uh, finding enough money uh, to do work so once I get bored of that challenge and uh, complacent about the work. Uh, I don't know. So suggestions are welcome. (laughs) Well, hopefully uh, a lot of my listeners are going to come and check out both of your shows right now. Folks, I fully endorse each of these. Uh, They are permanent places on my subscription list now. Helen, tell everybody where to find all the great work you're doing. Well, Answer Me This is at answermethispodcast.com and The Allusionist, which is allusionist with an A, not an I, not like David Blaine and David Copperfield type illusionist. <laughs> um, that's theallusionist.org. And then my personal website is helenzaltzman.com. And I think everything can be found through helenzaltzman.com, if I remember correctly. I was Hopefully. able to go out to just about everywhere. Good, and, good. Uh, I'm glad that the links were working and suitably situated for you to find them. Absolutely. And <laughs> Helen, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to oh, me. Thank it's, you. It, I've really enjoyed it. And it's been a real privilege to, uh, I know it's late over there, a, a real privilege to have a little bit of your time. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Good luck and with fo- the show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And folks, if you've enjoyed this week, a uh, rating on iTunes and Stitcher is greatly appreciated. Until next week, folks, my name's Dan Lizette. Thanks for listening. 
Thank you for listening to the Podcast Digest. You can follow the show on Twitter at Pod Digest. Like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Podcast Digest. Email the show feedback at the Podcast Digest at gmail.com. And you can find all the previous episodes and exclusive blog entries at the show's website, thepodcastdigest.info. Thank you.